My name is Cassie Choi and I live in San Francisco, California. My background is in critical care registered nursing by training, but I'm now the co-founder and chief operating officer of Pear Team. Pear Team provides tech-enabled care teams for safety net primary care systems and the vulnerable and marginalized patient populations they serve. Our tech-enabled care teams act as an extension of community health centers teams to provide a personalized, high-touch care experience while addressing patients' barriers to care, such as transportation, housing, food insecurity, and lack of cell phones. We ensure clinical best practices, integrate with community-based organizations, and automate administrative work so clinics can focus on their time with patients. Yeah, so my journey to starting Pear Team is an interesting one. One of my first jobs as a teenager was working at a pharmacy in my small town where I had to explain why someone's medications were covered by their insurance one month and then not the next, despite them being really important for their health. It sparked an interest in why the healthcare system worked the way it did from a very early age. So when I went to nursing school in Boston, I did a lot of work with vulnerable patient populations, working in homeless shelters, community outreach programs, and even working as a full-time tech in the emergency room. From there, I went on to critical care nursing in New York City and then San Francisco. I'm really passionate about helping my patients achieve the best health outcomes possible, but I also know the only way to help as many patients as possible is to help more clinicians all strive and do the same thing, do it more effectively. So I worked to create protocols to streamline patient care, worked with the innovation committees to test and roll out new devices, but when my hospital system can cut community health nursing programs, man, my frustration with the healthcare system working against me, just I reached a breaking point and I quit bedside nursing. And then I got a random LinkedIn message from a recruiter about a need for someone to draw blood at a startup. She couldn't tell me who they were or what they were doing, but I needed to pay my bills and I didn't have a plan for what was next for me. So I took her up on getting coffee and I spent our entire coffee date soapboxing about how frustrated I was at the healthcare system. So she introduced me to their founder and I ended up joining what ended up becoming Forward. And as an early employee, I had the opportunity to build their clinical operations playbooks, work on the product team to develop their technology that powered the clinical operations and create a tech enabled care team to support the care delivery outside of the clinic that we were building. And after Forward, I went on to Circle Medical, where on the leadership team, I built out another tech-enabled primary care clinic, a remote care team, and the custom EMR that powered it all. Um, it was great. They were both amazing experiences, um, but they served different patient populations. One was serving wealthy, uh, wealthy patient populations that could afford monthly access to care, and another was serving patients with really good insurance. Um, it was great, but they were not the patient populations that I was most passionate about serving and not the patient populations that I knew the technology and operations that we were building could really best serve. So I got together with my now co-founder, Neil Botlivala, who's an amazing engineer, a close friend, and a former colleague from the early days at Forward to think about the core problems of healthcare, the lack of coordination of services that really enable at-risk populations to achieve better health outcomes. And that's what led us to starting Pear Team. So my first time role as a critical care nurse after nursing school, I was in New York City and my eyes really opened up to a lot of systemic and policy issues within healthcare, but more specifically issues within the hospital system that I worked for. I think nursing school really teaches you a lot about, you know, procedures and policies in this idealistic way of nursing, but then you get out into the real world and it's a lot different and especially true in New York City. And so after about a year, I decided to not only leave my hospital, but leave New York City's healthcare system. And I wanted to find a way to explore other healthcare systems as well as a hospital system that aligned with my value system without having to make a career commitment. So travel nursing seemed like a good fit for me. Um, I moved to San Francisco and spent a little over two years as a travel nurse, uh, working in three different hospitals and five different units um, through different contracts. Um, and my experience gave me exposure to different EMR systems, different policies, 
workflows, management styles, and team dynamics. Um, but really, it tested my ability to learn quickly and deal with a lot of ambiguity. They don't give you a lot of um, on-the-job training um, and like prep time. You just learn very quickly by doing. Um, and it was a really great experience. Those two traits have been most crucial in building Pair Team as a founder. Yeah, so some of the issues that I found working in the hospital system was that a lot of money was spent, for example, um, on corporate ads. You know, there were ads at Yankee Stadium advertising our hospital as one of the top hospitals, which by ranking standards it was. But when you worked there, you know, we didn't have enough bed sheets for patients. We were lacking a lot of supplies. We were always understaffed, which is, you know, plaguing the healthcare system today. Um, and so how can you be a top hospital and lack the ability to deliver really good patient care? And then within the healthcare landscape within New York City, it was just vastly different than in Boston. In Boston, there were a lot of really great hospital systems um, within close proximity of each other, which gave patients the ability to choose um, which, which healthcare system they they sought access from. And in New York City, they were really spread apart and people had to just go to the one that was closest to them and were at the mercy of the care delivery system um, that was in their neighborhood, which often led to poor outcomes. Um, and so I was just really frustrated by that. Um, also, just by the way that you know, one hospital system would be a level three trauma center, which meant that they didn't have to take you know, the more severe traumas, which often led to a lot of medical debt that they had to take on um, and instead be a more surgical based um, higher reimbursement centers. Um, and the level one trauma centers were in poor neighborhoods um, and took on a lot of debt, which led to them, you know, closing their doors and led to poor access for those neighborhoods. So you just see a lot of systemic issues um, in, in large cities that I I didn't see when I was in Boston as a nursing student. And maybe it was there and I just didn't see it as much. Um, but I was frustrated by that. I think a lot of it has to do with um, systemic socioeconomic circumstances. You know, I, I think just like one large, you know, complex um, problem with a short, you know, vocabulary for it. But um, when people don't look alike, people aren't as motivated to solve a problem. But, you know, um, there's very poor coverage, health, care, health insurance coverage for people. And they live in neighborhoods where they have poor access to food, which leads to chronic diseases, which leads to higher health healthcare spend. Um, and then they don't have access to good health care, like, you know, primary care and um, critical care access in those neighborhoods um, because of high, you know, high debt in those areas. It's just like a, a chronic systemic issue. Um, but for example, I had a patient in, in cardiac critical care. Um, I took care of patients who had LVADs, so the machine that keeps your heart beating after heart failure or a severe heart attack. And the patients who have, you know, a lot of heart failure typically are people who've had poor access to like healthy foods for a long time or don't have access to good medication to keep their blood pressure low or poor health literacy to understand the need for, you know, healthier lifestyle choices. And then they end up with these like very complex machines that are very difficult to take care of. They need to connect themselves to, you know, electricity to keep those machines running. There's a lot of infection risk. They need to keep their um, their drive lines, the, the point of access uh, clean and, you know, uh, bandage changes all the time. And I was discharging a patient um, who had a language barrier she was Spanish speaking and she needed to go home. And I asked her who was going to be doing her bandage changes and cleanings. And she said a family member was going to do it, but her family member had never been trained on it. Um, and typically we send people home who've had uh, with family members who've had extensive training on it or with home health. And she had had neither. And Sure enough, she came back with a severe infection. And I think when someone who's wealthy comes in for this with this device, who it's because of a result of like a severe 
a heart attack, their family members are available to get this you know, extensive training and they can afford home health support. Um, and so it, it changes the trajectory of health outcomes um, based on socioeconomic status. And it's really difficult to see um, and frustrating as just like a bedside provider when you can't control the entire, you know, system to support health outcomes. Yeah. So I think we've tried to go more upstream from the places that I was trying to address at the bedside, right? I think for that patient, for example, spending more time with her earlier would have found that no one had investigated that a family member hadn't come in for training, right? Maybe that there was no family member available to do that training. But we've tried to go more upstream into addressing gaps in care and primary care. There are a little over 14,000 community health centers in America that make up the primary care safety net system that 75 million Medicaid patients alone rely on for health care needs. And that's not even including the uninsured patients that access community health centers in America. So they also not only provide primary care, but they also provide social support for their communities like access to food and transportation, housing, and more. Sometimes they even provide legal support. So what we've found, though, is that these community health centers are just fundamentally under-resourced, like a lot of other places of, of healthcare that we were just speaking about. They don't have enough funding, staff, or technology to do a lot of this work efficiently. So Pair Team comes in to extend this capability with our team and technology. Um, patients don't know us as Pair Team. They think that we're a member of their local health center. We identify their health needs or care gaps, as well as social needs that can impact a person's ability to meet their health needs, like access to food, and use our internal platform to address those gaps. We locate patients in the community and engage them into care, just call or text them, and schedule them for their wellness appointments with their local clinic or with our telemedicine providers which might be more convenient for them, and connect them with resources to meet their social needs, and do care coordination after the visit to ensure those post-visit needs are met, such as helping them to schedule their mammograms or labs or colonoscopies, um, really just ensuring that no one's lost to follow up, um, especially in their preventive care. For the clinics that we partner with, we really want to support them too. They wear a lot of hats. Um, and so we want to support them with tooling to give them insights into their patient's social and care needs and automate the documentation and coding um, that they're really they're burdened with and help them reduce their clinical burnout. Yeah, so our team today is staffed with nurse practitioners that are doing, you know, phone based visits with patients for annual wellness exams. For example, we're now moving into after hours care to extend the, the hours that patients can access primary care, urgent care visits to divert patients from needing to go to the emergency room for simple things um, where they just needed like a real time visit. Um, and now we're moving into mental health. Um, and so I'm not sure for the visit, the, you know, people who are watching here, but in America, mental health access is very difficult to come by, especially for their vulnerable populations that we serve. And so we can provide visits for anxiety and depression um, access, medication management, all through telemedicine, which makes access a lot easier. You know, if you're working two to three jobs, you don't have time to drive to a, um, an office and do a visit and then come back. If we can just pick up the phone and do a visit on your break, it makes accessing mental health resources a lot easier. Enjoying this episode? Ever thought of starting your own podcast? PodUp.com is your go-to. They've got everything you need to run a pro show, including 35 or more AI-powered tools for success. Sign up today for a free starter account and get 15% off with the code HEALTHYTALKS15. The code is HEALTHYTALKS15. Plus, Check out podallies.com for a done-for-you podcasting experience, complete with website, social media, and editing. Start now and let's launch your podcast together. Yeah, so a very regular workflow is that a member of the pair team, patient services team, our care navigators, will reach out to a patient and say, hey, like, this is 
Sky calling from the local health center. Um, you're due for your annual wellness exam when works for you. And maybe the patient is available on Tuesday at 9 a.m. And our clinic doesn't have any availability. These clinics are very short staffed, even in the provider space, and they have limited access. But we do have a nine o'clock availability with our provider, Katie, who does telemed visits. And it looks like this patient's care gaps can all be closed through telemedicine, like a depression screen, tobacco cessation screening. Um, you know, they have a, a breast cancer screening, a mammogram that needs to be ordered. And so we can do all these things through telemedicine and engage them back into care, um, back with their, their local health center through a telemedicine visit. And so we'll schedule them for Tuesday at 9 a.m. Katie will give the patient a call on Tuesday at 9 a.m. and they'll do a visit with Katie. Before that visit, we'll have sent them all of their screening forms, their you know PHQ-9, the depression screening, a health risk assessment to understand, you know, when was their last mammogram? Do they get care anywhere else in the community? All of those sorts of things. Um, and Katie will have all of that information available for her visit with the patient. Um, and then if Katie identifies any needs of the patient that need to be done on site, for example, an EKG, our care team will just reach out to the patient after the visit and we'll schedule a visit on site with the clinic um, per the availability of the patient and the clinic to do the on site care as required. Um, but to the patient, they've already had their annual wellness exam with a provider from that clinic. Um, Katie works for the clinic. Um, all of those notes are documented in the local health center's EMR for when the patient goes in for that on site EKG. They know the reason why the EKG was ordered. And then that patient has built a relationship with their local health center. So they're more likely to show up for that visit and know how to access care in the future. Today, we're only local to the United States, especially we're currently working with clinics in California, New York, and soon Texas. Um, but the way that we think about it is how should care be delivered? And then the regulations around the state or even the country is easy things that we can figure out. And so we're focused on the United States today, but there's nothing that would prevent us from moving to other countries in the future. Um, really, the, the fundamentals of it are that clinics Clinicians need more support to, to support the communities that they serve. And the ways that we think about it are what things should be done on site versus the, with the support of an off site team in a virtual first model. Um, and that can be applied internationally. So, Pair Team works primarily with primary care clinics that serve at risk patient populations. In particular, we work with government health plans such as Medicaid, which is the one that supports those living below the poverty line, and then Medicare, the one that supports the elderly. And these clinics are often federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, um, and these are grant funded community health centers. We also support independent clinics that serve these same patient populations. These are typically in like rural areas of America. So Pair Team helps clinics by extending their ability to support their patient population, access improved health outcomes while removing some of the many hats that the staff wear at the clinic. Um, like I said, they wear many, many hats every single day. I'm sure that the people here who are clinicians know that you don't just, you know, room the patient. You're also like helping them at the bathroom. You're checking in the patient. You're answering the phone and you're also like doing a visit. Um, but because these clinics are underfunded and understaffed, oftentimes the responsibilities we can support with are just one of the many um, that this of the hats that the staff wear at the clinic. So by removing one of the um, hats and moving them to peer team, the on-site clinical team can focus on the patients in front of them and ensure that they're getting the best experience possible on site, which is really important. When patients have their social needs met and their health needs met, Clinics can improve their revenue based on how these health plans reimburse clinics for health outcomes in America. And when health clinics have more revenue, they can meaningfully reinvest those dollars back into the clinic and community with programs like dental clinics, mobile health bands, and additional staff. But for us, we really think about how we can continue to build relationships with patients by meeting them outside the clinic. And then when they come on site to the clinic, having really great experiences, build relationships and help, help improve investments into health.
Yeah, so we, when we reach patients outside of the clinic, we text with them, we call them, and we can email with patients. And so we're really trying to help improve the communication outside of the clinic so they don't feel like the only time that they can reach the clinic is by calling them and sitting on hold or showing up at the clinic and waiting for an appointment. Um, so by engaging with them through these other communication methods and not by having to log into a portal or anything. We want to build relationships with patients to help them invest in their, you know, into their health um, and build relationships back with their clinic um, and just streamline that. And so their in-person um, relationships are really with the clinicians on site at the clinic and the more remote, you know, telemed and, you know, non-face-to-face -face relationships are with the pair team uh, clinicians. Yeah, so patients ultimately have the rights um, to their own medical records. And so if a patient wants their medical records transferred to another clinic, we can take care of the administrative pieces of transferring records to another clinic. And unfortunately, the, you know, the healthcare system runs by fax. And so we would just transfer their medical records via fax after they've authorized that transfer. Um, we don't have to work with the other clinic in order to make that transfer happen. Um, we can just fax their records there. Um, it does make it easier if we're, the, if we're working with the providers on both ends. Um, but ultimately, um, we can coordinate the transfer of records anywhere. Um, we already facilitate record transfer if a patient is being discharged from the hospital, for example. So um, if a patient is admitted to the hospital, um, we get a or a discharge from the hospital, we get a notification of that discharge, and uh, we'll reach out to the patient to initiate a discharge follow-up visit with a provider to you know, review the reason for admission, do a medication reconciliation, all of that. And in the meantime, while we're scheduling, we'll get a um, authorization from the patient to request their medical records from that admission and um, transfer the records from the hospital to the primary care physician who's gonna be doing that discharge follow-up visit. So we already do a lot of record transfers right now. Oh, this is really good. So Pair Team's internal platform drives everything that we do every day. So we have workflows that ensure that the right work happens at the right time for the right patient and that no one is lost to follow up. We also have a communication platform so that our care team can communicate with the patients and caregivers through phone calls, texts, and emails. And you heard me right, even the caregivers. So we know that this patient is cared for by this person and what their relationship is so that we don't reach out to the wrong person. Um, we've also integrated into our clinics charting systems and automate documentation and billing through this process that's known as robotic process automation. It's really just, you can think of it as digital assistants that do all the button clicking and data entry that someone at the clinic would do, like a medical assistant or front desk staff member would do, like prepping for a visit. We just do it all automatically. So we don't require any integrations. And that's why we can work with all sorts of EMRs and our process to get set up with a clinic is, is fairly easy. So the way that we think about technology is how can we use technology to help people do their jobs easier and not make it harder like most you know, healthcare workers think of technology getting in the way. Well, everyone hates hearing the word implementation. <laughs> especially, you know, clinics and staff. I hated hearing that word when I was in the hospital. Um, so we think about that a lot um, when we start working with a new clinic partner and how we can be successful in mitigating an implementation process. You know, clinics don't need a new platform or technology to log into. There's already so many for them to use and there's never enough hands to use all of them. So we work right out of the clinic's existing platforms their EMR. Um, so implementation is actually a lot more on our side um, of learning a lot about the clinic and how we can best support them. So how do they like their appointment schedule when we do their appointment scheduling? Is it a 15 minute appointment, a 20 minute appointment? Who works there and what roles do they play? What is their patient population like? All of those things. So a lot of that implementation work is on our behalf. And then the training for the team at the clinic is pretty straightforward, or at least we try to make it that way. Um, we have lunch together and introduce who we are, how we want to help them achieve their goals as a clinic, and what they can expect to see. Patients on their schedule, by our team, um, notes in their EMR, by our nurse practitioners doing visits for them. 
social and care needs in their EMR um, that we tell them that, you know, when patients come in, which care gaps they need to be closed. And then the documentation uh, completed for them um, so that they don't have to worry about it. So we try to make it really easy for them to understand how we're there to support them, not new things that they need to learn how to do. Uh, we also make sure to go over which hats they can now take off um, so that we're not duplicating work. Um, so implementation is about three weeks from the time we sign a contract. This time, first patients are usually on their schedule, and that's usually how long it takes for us to learn a new clinic. You've seen one clinic, you've seen one clinic. So we try to you know, streamline the process of learning everything we can about a clinic and, and putting it to work. Yeah, I think we have to be careful about how we phrase like supporting them. Um, you know, we don't we're not there to take anyone's job. Um, we're not there to like, you know, reduce the staffing of a clinic. We're there to support and be additive to a clinic to help them, you know, support more members of their clinic. By no means are we there to say now you can fire this person because we're going to do their job for them. The idea is this one person's wearing seven hats and we should reduce some of the hats they're wearing so they can do the other jobs very well um, and focus on the patients in front of them. So sometimes, you know, people will be like, but wait, that's part of my job. Am I going to lose my job if you're now doing my job? And so it's a lot of education. And fundamentally, everything we do is about trust building. Trust building with the patients that we support, trust building with the providers that we're working alongside and the front desk staff and the medical assistants with the leadership um, and the entire community. Everything that we do is about trust building. Um, but you're right, not everyone like wants to like change everything they're doing right away. Um, and some providers are really good at, at preventive services already. And so some of the support that we provide around like nudging preventive services is not needed. But if we can help them understand that we've done a lot of work before the visit of helping a patient get into housing, that builds trust with the provider or helping them understand that after the visit, if they order a mammogram, that that patient will actually get a mammogram, that's trust building. And so I think what trust means to different people within a clinic means different things. And so it just takes time for people to, to build um, that relationship with us. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, one of the really amazing things about, you know, founding pair team as opposed to being a bedside nurse is that our ability to support people is so much greater than it was only being able to care for two to three patients a day. Trust me, I miss the one on one of being a bedside nurse. But now um, our patient services team and our nurse practitioners are supporting so many more people and our clinics are supporting so many people um, that we partner with now. Um, for example, um, this patient, John, don't worry, not real names. Um, John was part of a substance abuse program with one of our clinics um, and he was due for an annual wellness visit. So we reached out to him um, to schedule that visit. Uh, but when we reached out to, to re-engage him with care, we had learned that he was having a a hard time staying sober and he had moved away from the area that our clinic was in. Um, so we got him connected with a telehealth visit to address some urgent clinical concerns that he had and then some re some resources to reapply for Medicaid because a lot of people lapsed in their, in their uh, insurance coverage. We got him some food resources, transportation, and some housing in his new area. Um, that was a good one. And then another recent example that was really great. Um, that uh, our care navigators um, had worked on was Sarah. Uh, Sarah had been struggling with a lack of access to housing and transportation. And that leads to a lot of no-shows at the clinic by, you know, no one's fault. People can want to access care all they want, but if, you know, housing and is your first uh, priority, everything else goes away. Um, so uh, persistent outreach and relationship building by Liberty um, on our team, she, coordinated a mammogram for Sarah, and she was unfortunately ultimately diagnosed with breast cancer, but um, our team re-engaged her with um, primary care at one of our clinics. So she has long-term care for her cancer, and now we're coordinating her um, with transportation to ensure she doesn't have any lapses in care. And we got her um, coordinated with some housing resources. So hopefully that allows her to really focus on her health. Um, and it's just an example of, of the work that our uh, patient services team does every day. Um, a lot of it I don't even hear about. They just do this all the time. <laughs> 